morning, good afternoon, good evening, Y Whales, wherever in the world you are today. So it is July 20th. We are uh, a little bit over halfway through summer, and, and clearly everyone's running around vacationing. Um, but but we have a huge but here, and that is the fact that Bitcoin is still hovering right around 30K. Um, you know, we've come back from the 16, 17, like, you know, cryptocurrency is over, everything's dead, crypto winter, you know, everyone just pack your bags up and go home, um, to, to a relatively stable cryptocurrency market, and that's been led by a couple ETFs. Uh, most notably the one filed by BlackRock. And I think that's really given a lot of consumer confidence into the space. Doesn't mean investments have come back. However, uh, in conjunction with Web3 and, and, and cryptocurrencies is AI. Um, and AI is stealing all the thunder that is possibly imaginable. So all the funding and in, in times, you know, two or three um, has certainly gone into AI development. And really, I think it's starting to showcase a very fluid market. Um, the understanding that blockchain is most likely, in my opinion, not designed for humans, but is designed for machines to be able to interpret what humans need. Um, and there's so many other things that we're going to talk about today because uh, we have an amazing uh, presenter with us with Teo Priestley. A futurist technologist. I, there's so many things I, I'm not even going to massacre your intro, but I'm really excited to have my co-host today, Siva Varu. Um, Siva is our managing director of uh, YWL Solutions. Um, but Teo, let's go ahead and as the man of honor, could, would you mind to give us a little bit on your uh, background and how you got here today? Um, yeah, thanks, Jane. Thanks, Siva. Um, I've got a very eclectic background. I, I couldn't even call it career. It's more like a kit bag of experience. Um, I started around 20, 25 years ago in retail banking um, as a COBOL mainframe programmer. Um, and then I moved into business transformation and, and software transformation, um, running projects and programs um, within, the, within the same sort of industry um, across the UK and Europe. During that time, I, I guess I... I found it really interesting that the reports that were being written by technology analysts and so forth were actually so far removed from what was happening on the ground that I decided to write a blog myself um, because I was a practitioner and I was actually right in there. And I was really fascinated with trends. So what was coming around the corner, You know, what um, kind of emerging technologies were businesses looking to adopt? What was really happening in the C-suite versus what was actually being written about by analysts? Um, and that's when I started to just basically write uh, as I was conducting programs, and um, it just became it just became habit and quite normal for me. Um, then I started to do speaking, so I got picked up by so I moved away from the, um, the 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 actual practitioner side of things, and I actually started to work on the vendor side. So that gave me an appreciation of what vendors were saying and what they were talking about and why the analysts were talking to them. Um, and, and, and I started speaking about these trends um, uh, globally. And that's where I kind of picked up the, the tag of futurist. You know, I didn't adopt it. It was kind of sort of handed to me by a lot of people who were saying, oh, you're writing about future trends and you're telling us what's going to happen next. So, you know, you're a futurist. And I thought, eh, I'll run with it. You know, I'll let it, I'll let it roll. And, um, and yeah, I've been doing it ever since. I, I you know, i I um I still write and I still speak. I wrote a book um, during the pandemic with a few others uh, of like-minded people, um, and we published a book on future trends that that covered more than just technology. So we looked at education, we looked at economics, we looked at space, we looked at AR and VR and AI. I wrote a chapter on AI, for example. Um, so it was it was it was really interesting. I've had a you know I've done marketing, I've done product development. Um, you know, I've ran companies uh, for VCs. I've run my own startup. You know, it's, I just like to do really interesting things. That's amazing. Things. And, I, and I love that. And, you know, hearing about Cobalt and in, in old and banking systems, I'm sure a lot of your code is still in, in operation yeah. today, which is the scary thing. <clears throat> You know, one of the one of the things that really brought me into Web three so so heavily was um, during Web one when this all was first coming online. I was a, a CTO for a, a retail operation, and you know, really got to see exactly how commerce works. You know, how things flow from the banks to the retailers to the vendors. You know, payroll and everything else. So I, I had this really intuitive knowledge of you know ERPs, CRMs, and and all the the various management tools that used. Um, and and you know. For anyone that's ever worked in an AS400 or, or, you know, like an old Oracle system, you realize how bad these things are and how basic they are compared to even just the, the laptop that sits in front of me in terms of processing power and, and kind of <clears throat> novelty. And blockchain to me was kind of the first time where I go, you know, there's... 
as we start to get into the Ethereum, Ethereum world of, of smart, you know, kind of smart contracts and everything else, um, you know, I understand cryptocurrencies and I think that that's all great. But suddenly you have a reason that a, a retailer, a bank, a, a, some sort of institution should take a look at this old ERP system that they have running on an archaic mainframe and, and start to really think about like, where does this data actually belong? Because sitting in the basement, you know, that just, you know, collecting dust or that only a handful of people have access to it isn't, you know, really good for, for anyone. Uh, it doesn't help logistics, doesn't help for forecasting, doesn't help, you know, the, the staff or employees or share prices and, and having, you know, the ability to kind of free flow these information, um, really was one of the biggest kind of takeaways and got me to, to really spend a lot of time in web three. And now here I am full time. Um, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about, you know, the, the doors, that you know, a, a, a permissioned um, private chain could bring to to some of these institutions that you worked at, you know, a couple of decades ago. Yeah, I think for me, one of the key things is is to is to really sort of hone in on the fact that the blockchain is a ledger based system, you know, and and once you start getting past the cryptocurrency side of things and NFTs and smart contracts, um, you understand that this is actually um, infrastructure technology. It, it, and it's it's quite boring when you bought it, when you distill it down because it is like you say it's a ledger it's a database um, but it's a, it's immutable and it's permissioned especially if it's private. Now, what's really interesting is that it becomes a system of record um, and almost like a golden source of truth uh, because of those um, um, uh, those requirements that it has or, the, or those attributes that it has. So for organizations like banking and for, you know, supply chain management, like you say, ERP, invoicing, finance systems, all these kind of sort of, you know, all the back end stuff that everybody hates, it's, it's, it's absolutely perfect for that um, because of that kind of immutability and, go, you know, and source of, or source of truth. You know, and I've seen people use it for, for, for in the diamond trade, for example, to basically prove the provenance of where the diamond was sourced from, its actual carrot, pre-cut, the carrot after cutting, etc. Where, you know, was it sourced ethically? You know, what mine did it come from? How, you know, the carbon footprint of that mine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, um, the whole supply chain can be tracked and traced and made public if it's if that's what you're looking for. And in the same way, financial transactions. Um, and I think this is really important for for businesses moving forward. Um, to get away from old style um, databases and, and things like that and, and actually start looking at um, blockchain. And then I think there's, you know, th this is, we'll, we'll bring it up now, but I think this is actually really useful for, for AI um, as well, because at the moment we're seeing a lot of generative AI being built, but not a lot of, of um, proof of where sources have come from um, because obviously we understand that it's scraped data um, and then it starts to hallucinate and make up its own sources and things. And I think blockchain could be a really interesting piece of infrastructure technology as to act as a source of truth for AI to tap into and prove when it spits something back out at you that, yeah, this is this is a verified truth and I haven't made it up. I haven't made up the sources. And I, and. and this this is where I think I'm I'm a real believer in the confluence of separate technologies that we um, we think of as siloed. So blockchain, AI, you know, Web three in itself, the metaverse, for example, as well. No. These are not silos, and they shouldn't be treated as such. Yeah, we should actually cool, be looking to combine these. I love, these as much I as love that, and you know, this is something I tell a lot of clients actually, because a lot of clients right now we're so early in this place. I spend a lot of time educating them on where the potential of blockchain could be applied to their businesses. Mm. And a thesis that Jay and I kick around quite a bit and that we truly believe here, and I'm a huge personal believer, is that blockchain, for the first time, could be that centralized data highway for entire industries. We have so much of our space, so much of the Web3 degen space that are just evangelizing the decentralization of everything. And that's great, right? When you think about true ownership of data and what have you. But when you think about a lot of the inefficiencies and a lot of the fractionalization and the siloed ownership of data in the enterprise and the commercial space, you know, think about a use case, for example, in healthcare, right? A big reason why healthcare processing just sucks 
mm-hmm. is because you have all of you have the epics and the cerners and all these big organizations that basically have built their businesses on the back of be, building their proprietary data ip which is health data records that basically they control the entire process because they're saying you can access this data when we tell you to access this data but imagine if there was a centralized data highway let's call it for the entire healthcare industry to say that hey Teo, you know, you've got a singular digital identity and for your entire life, all of your medical data is being attested and validated and being written to a centralized distributed ledger that now, regardless of what doctor you go to, what hospital you go to, if they need to go and find out your vaccination history, your medical history or what have you, you know, confines of GDPR, this is where I think something like ZK proofs is going to be really powerful right? Validating data without exposing the true data attributes. I can now say that, Teo, you've, you've had these symptoms or you've had these ailments three years ago and it's been recorded and you could be visiting a, an ER in you know, Botswana or something. And that da- doctor could have instant access to that and give you a more favorable prognosis or diagnosis. And I think that's where a lot of companies or a lot of, you know, the first use yeah. case of blockchain is crypto. But I think that is such, that is the smallest use case for blockchain. And uh, I, I think as more industry players, especially when they think about the inefficiencies of their entire industries, healthcare, real estate, institutional finance, right? And thinking about if we can create a communication protocol, which is that blockchain layer that shows true data transparency. And now we create permission rule sets or permission rules or tokenizing, right? Or token gating access on who can write and who can attest and who can validate and who can prove and blah, 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 blah. We can potentially improve how industries move and interact with one another, especially supply chain, vertically integrated and all that stuff quicker than ever before. But it takes those industries to understand that, right? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I wrote about this about several years ago, actually, when I used to write for Forbes. And there were a couple of things that I picked up, especially for IoT and blockchain and then blockchain plus AI. Um, and, it, and at the same time, it was like blockchain was the backbone for both because it managed that data access. And like you say, back then, there wasn't any zero knowledge proof or there certainly wasn't being written about an awful lot. But the idea that you could you could query data and ask a question and not actually have the, the real data exposed, but just get the kind of sort of yes and no back, which I think is really important for, um, which, well, this is why I believe wallets are actually going to be um, the future of identity, for example, because the wallet could be the custodian of all your identity, of, of your ID and your, your, your personalized data. And essentially, that it's that zero knowledge kind of thing where websites will query it. So if you go into a, you know an eighteen plus website or to view something that's you know has a, an age requirement, all it has to do is is is, is this person over eighteen. It doesn't need your date of birth to know that. It will just spit back and say, yes, they are. It's, you know, I've oh. got the identity documents. It's proven. You know, it's verified. Yeah, that, that's yeah, and, it. And, so there's. I was going to say that that's a really interesting concept. You know, wallet, nope. think of your, your financial identity, right? Think of all, you know, people, mo- most of the world have to apply for loans. And every time you apply for a new loan, you have to go and fill out the same information over and over and over and over again. It doesn't really change, right? Unless if you're, you know, applying, you know, every 10 mm-hmm. years or so or whatever, right? You have to do a whole update. But imagine if you had, you know, Teo Prisley's wallet identity, that every year you just updated, you know, what's changed from, you know, verification of assets, employment, income, credit, blah, 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 blah. And then every year, all you have to do Mm -hmm. is just say a checkbox, hey, this is correct or this is not correct. And uh, this is what the new attributes are. These are their new numbers. Now go and I'm gonna go apply for a student loan. I'm gonna go apply for a mortgage. I'm gonna go apply for a personal loan, auto loan, what have you. Now, instead of me having to go and fill out these attributes and then also go and have their underwriters go and try to validate this and take 15 days of processing time, it could be instantaneous because it's already been attested and validated. Right. And you could, that's an amazing concept. I love Mm -hmm. that. Well, yeah, I mean, and, and then if you, if you roll AI into that, you don't need the underwriter to do the work for you either. 
because the AI is going to do all the valid, you know, it'll have the, you know, the zero not, well, the wallet will do the verification and the AI will do the processing. And essentially you'll have something, uh, you know, a decision, like you say, takes 15 days or whatever on a manually based process or a case management system that has to go through various sort of validation checks and, and authorization, but an AI could basically run those tasks and then come back with something in a third of the time or even a, a fifth of the time. So again, AI and blockchain and decentralized technologies, that, that it's like a marriage made in heaven, but it, it needs people to start thinking about We're so about early that. in the technology cycle, you know, and, and right now a wallet is just like, it, it's the email of, of the early 90s. It's like there's an inbox and then that's it. Like, you know, there, there's nothing else. And so I, I, I think that mm. one of the, I, there's a bunch of problems with Web3. Um, and one of those is just, I think you're, you're entirely right. People are not thinking about wallets correctly. Um, and I think, you know, to me, like a, a wallet should be something more similar to an email, uh, you know, inbox or, or most likely Dropbox, you know, ability to sort, move around uh, and, and kind of be able to find everything because already my wallets mm. are useless. And then you combine in, you know, homomorphic <laughs> encryption, which is what you're just talking about, where you can expose, you know, answers to data without actually exposing the data um, and then, to, you know, add in token gating and everything else. And it's a very rich environment for machines um, that you can, that humans can, can put those, those uh, barriers around like, where is that AI bot allowed to go? What's it allowed to do um, without having to worry about like, I don't know, the AI bot just decided to remove all my stuff and now it's gone um, or decided to repost the stuff. And so I think there's a lot of, you know, more work. <laughs> there's a lot more work that has to be done. Where, where in this cycle do you think we, <laughs> we are today? Like if we kind of say that web one, um, you know, really hit right around like 99, 2000 when it was like, okay, it's mainstream. We're now able to like conduct credit card transactions and everything's fine, you know, and, and all the way back to like 92, 93, where it's just like people were playing around with is more kind of a novelty, you know, with, with dial up modems and everything else. Where, where do you think mm -hmm. we are on a scale right now of web three? Um, I still think we're in that kind of sort of early stage novelty phase. I mean, I'm a firm believer that for Web3 to really come into its fore, um, it's going to have to be developed alongside Web2. And then that choice is going to be offered to a future generation. It probably won't be. Well, it'll be offered to us and we'll decide whether or not we want to go. But for someone who's just completely starting fresh, you know, and, this, and picks up a, 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 you know, a digital device for the first time, um, there, you know, I would hope that at that point in time, there would be a choice to sort of say, right, well, nobody knows my identity. You know, my parents haven't posted pictures of me on uh, Facebook or TikTok or whatever. You know, this is my chance to actually start fresh. Um, and I want to start in a decentralized world where I control my, uh, you know, my verification and all my data. Because as soon as you enter Web 2, it's gone. You've lost your privacy. You know, there's no way of clawing it back. So the idea of Web three saying of Web three at this point in time, and, and certainly the, the 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 way that some thinking has been limited to, is oh, we'll create Web two point five and it'll allow people to capture some of their data again and control it. And it's like, but it's too late because you know for the time that I've been on this planet, they've had, they've had well fifty years of basically extrapolating as much of my life and my data and my habits as possible that even if I turned off the tap, it wouldn't matter. They know enough to basically probably extrapolate the next 20 years of my life and make guesses based on behavior and patterns and stuff like that. So for really for Web3 to take off truly as it was meant to be, it has to start as Web1 was, which was somebody's server on a desk with a sticky pad that says, don't switch off, <laughs> which, which was Tim Berners-Lee. And it took, it took two years to build 50 websites. Obviously, it's not going to take that long now, but we have to have the patience to build it bit by bit. And the trouble is, is that, Web3 has been seen as some kind of uh, blockchain crypto scam. Um, you know, um, haven scam. Yeah, I was trying to avoid the word scam, but I mean, look how many altcoins there are, you know, and, and um, you know, layer ones, layer two, layer three solutions, you know, 19,000 dApps or whatever, but they're all, um, they're all exchanges or they're all, um, you know, just wallet solutions. There's nothing useful for people. Yeah, well, it, it, let me, um, ask, let me, let me so, kind of extrapolate on that it, concept real quick, Teo. And, and so one of the things that, that made Web1 work, 
compared to web two is standardization. And I talk about this quite often. Like I, if you give mm -hmm. me your email address, that's all I need to know. I don't care where you host it at. I don't care what kind of machine you have, where in the world you are. And, and if, and if we're having a conversation and I need to bring Siva or someone else in, I just need their email address. Nothing, nothing else is needed to know. It just works. You know, mm -hmm. Mac PC, so there's a, there's two or three Linux people out there still, still trying to convince us that there's a third party. Um, but, but it works and it's because of those standards in, in web two, we've kind of gotten away to this, this, this app world. And if I say, Hey, no problem. I'd, I'd like to message you later. It's going to start a long conversation <laughs> that we're going to have to have about where are you? Hey, I need you to approve me to be able to send you a message. See if I may or may not be on that, that platform. And it's just really gotten into this chaotic world, um, in web two. And then you get into web three and it's like, it, it, it's almost impossible to educate people on like, well, okay, you, you moved USDC, but what, what chain were you on? Well, I don't know what chain I was on. Well, what wallet were you using? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. I clicked on this and it did, like, it's, it's become so convoluted and so many little fiefdoms because if you, even in web one or web two, nobody cares if you're hosted on S3 or Azure, it's like, does it work? Yes or no. Great. Then it's going to be adopted mm -hmm. and it has other protocols. How, how are we going to get over this? Like decentralization chaos that we've created already in web three to actually make it usable for people. Uh, it's, it's all like, like I said, it's almost like going back to the basics of web one or web two in a sense, pre pre apps and coming back with a, a set of protocols and, uh, you know, network protocols from the start that people just regular people want to use and understand and mm -hmm. learn and make it easy for them. The problem with web three was that it just became a, you know, a Deegan's paradise where, you know, unless you were a script kiddie. <laughs> Um, nobody, you know, nobody could understand what you were, what you were trying to do, um, or what you were saying to them. Um, and, and that's a real shame because obviously there's value and there's power in, in, in what web three is trying to do and the decentralization side and blockchain and whatnot, but everything was so like you say convoluted, it, it was horrendous in terms of user experience. Um, and because it was couched in so much bullshit bingo, um, you know, nobody beyond that echo chamber could could care less. So and, until we just make it as absolutely foolproof as possible that, the you know, your grand could pick up, pick it up and, and run with something without any knowledge. Um, that's 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 where we need to get to for for mainstream adoption, plus the fact that it has to have everyday use. Uh, nothing that has, that has been built has any everyday use for the average person on the street. If you walk, if you walk into your local coffee shop or stand in the middle of a supermarket, for example, great litmus test. You can just point people out and say they wouldn't understand. They wouldn't understand. They wouldn't understand. And if you get through that entire thing and only pick out two or three people out of the hundreds of people that pass through that that you know that building, you've got a problem. Whereas if I shout, you know, who's on what, who's on WhatsApp or who's, who's using Just Eat or Deliveroo, hands would go up. If you shouted, you know, who's using MetaMask, <laughs> people are like that. And, What's and that? I, and is I, is, yeah, is, and I, is and COVID I come back? Because I, I think that we're still like, we're still really confusing people about a lot oh, of things. Yeah. Because if you say who's on WhatsApp or who's on Signal, those are user interfaces that are very friendly mm. to use. If you say, you know, hey, are, who's using, you know, homomorphic versus, you know, whatever encryption levels, they're going to be like, they're going to look at you the same way. And I think we're still talking so much inside baseball, yeah. whether, you know, Ethereum versus Polygon versus Avalanche, like nobody cares. 99% no, of the people on this planet have don't even understand what in the world we're talking about, nor do they care. The question is, does it work? And I think that we've gotten so many, you know, fanboyisms mm -hmm. right now with like, oh, it's got to be this way or it's got to be that way. I'm a multi-chain person. I think, you know, you got to be chain agnostic. You have, there's going to be a gazillion of these things. And, and as long as there's st the bridges, you know, and, and protocols are standardized, I think they're going to talk very well to each other. And I, you know, that's why I, I like, um, Avalanche, mm -hmm. not Avalanche, um, um, Polkadot so much, you know, Polkadot. I really think that they've done a good job of like making it at least start to move in that direction where they know we're not going to be the, the only ones here. Um, but we need it to be able to flow very well. Is, is that your thought as well? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's 
to your point about does it work i mean when i call it when i use uber for example or another taxi app i don't care if where it's been hosted what protocol you know do they use to send the message to the driver to, to the driver to accept how the money is transmitted etc cetera, etc cetera. i just want to know that if i call for an a, a, a cab or a taxi it's going to arrive at the time that i specified it's going to arrive in time and it's going to get me to the de destination in time and safely and the same when I order food. Now, like you say, nobody cares about what's going on underneath the hood as long as it works. And as long yeah. as it's safe and there's privacy and security and everything else. But they don't need to know that the security protocol is blah, 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 blah. And it's been certified by this organization and stuff like that. And it's, it must be that it has to be the same with Web3, especially if we're if you know, if we build it in a chain agnostic way, nobody cares what chain you're going to use and how the bridges work as long as they're safe and it damn well works. You know, something goes from A to B and it works. And that's where we need to get to. I mean, all the marketing, for example, that I've ever seen for Web3 has been focused on, you know, what we're building, how we're building it, what chain it is. Oh, it uses, you know, our yeah. chain can achieve yeah. 2000 TPS or whatever it is and blah, 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 blah. And it's like, yeah. but I don't care who yeah. are you marketing yeah. to. You know, are you marketing to the VC to yeah. get them excited or, or to the, or I, to I the like influencers really going to write time, about uh, you? my brain right now. Uh, it's like, I, 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 tell, <laughs> I, I tell Jay this on the weekends all the time when we're at like dinner. I feel like 95% of Web3 right now is just a bunch of solutions searching for problems to solve. And a lot of the projects that even we come across from our deal flow mm -hmm. is, uh, quite frankly, a bunch of it is BS, right? And, you know, the only people that they can really evangelize the nature of what it is they're trying to accomplish is the other technical guys that understand what they built or kind of understood what they built. But there's no, mm -hmm. I have yet to see, to your point, uh, a Web3 company that is truly marketed the message of what is the true value proposition to the end consumer. How is this going to make your life easier or better or resolve a gap or a capability that hasn't been resolved yet today, right? And that's, it's, it, it is kind of similar in the early 90s, right? Like when um, early communication and even forums and all that good stuff, the only people that were actually or building, you know, on MS-DOS or what have you, it would, they were only talking to other programmers at that time because those are the only other people that cared. That's where I feel like we're at Web3 right now. It's a bunch of nerds talking about, you know, the technical technological mm. capabilities of what future applications this could bring about, right? But it, we haven't gotten to that point yet where it's, okay, the light bulb is clicked. This is how it's going to transform a lot of inefficiencies in our everyday lives. And yeah, I, I'm just echoing everything that you just said. I, I love it. So let, 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 let's... <laughs> I think it's comparable to... Oh, I was going to say, oh, let's talk about AI real quick, because I feel like AI is kind of trending down the same narrative, right? Everyone is espousing the big LLMs, you know, ChatGPT, BARD. If you're not doing it, it's the same thing with Web3. If you're not doing Web3 or blockchain, your business is going to be disrupted. Now everything is, if you're not on AI, you're going to be left behind. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, we're already seeing AI casualties, to be honest. I mean, Jasper, for example, um, you know, they started I don't know, less than 12 months ago with stupid valuations because they basically built a business on top of chat GPT that allowed people to create content. And of course, what moat did they have? They basically built a service on top of another service that everybody else is using anyway. Um, so, so they're having to, I think they're, well, I think they're pivoting away from that now because they realize that there's nothing left um, and their valuation has gone down the pan. And I think some, some um, senior, some senior seniors have actually left the company as well, but we're seeing that with like startups already, which is, you know, they span up, they, they, they got some VCs who, um, who were suffering FOMO um, who invested in them, but now they have nothing because obviously they're built on top of a service that, you know, that is not under their control. Um, but the interesting thing that we're seeing now with, you know, with AI and large language models is that businesses are starting to understand that they don't actually need the biggest, widest, most, you know, intelligent inverted commas, um, version because they want something that's built for their business. And the only way 
um, they're ever going to do that is to actually build it themselves because only they know their business or, or their industry better than, you know, another third party solution. So, cause they have the data as well. So they have the data internally to train these, you know, these algorithms and large language models themselves. That's why Bloomberg built Bloomberg GPT 40 years of financial an analysis. It's perfect for them to just basically throw at a, a large language model and train it to basically become, you know, a, a, a company wide financial analyst that anyone can use to their benefit. And, and so they're on query. So I think banks and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, banks are going to be great. I think um, in terms of, of that kind of thing, you know, that kind of market customer service, all those kind of sort of things. But yeah. then we get into the ethical side, which is, you know, where do I get, you know, there's, consent when we from? go over the show there, there's the technology and it's going to rapidly evolve it. You know, we've kind of had that light bulb moment when all of a sudden, you know, and AI has been around for, you know, 30 plus years. We were just talking about earlier, you know, Steve Jobs at, mm. the, at the introduction of the first Mac was talking about how AI is going to revolution our revolutionize our lives and it just took a lot longer for it to, as to get there and, and get a few things clicking and the horsepower behind it um i think the most interesting thing that we're seeing right now that that is controllable um is kind of the regulation that's starting to fall out uh there's a couple of articles that we went over earlier today mm -hmm. um and i think one of those which is really kind of the most um egregious to me which is uh senator grassley or casey i'm sorry uh, Senator Casey introduced uh, two new bills aimed at protecting workers from artificial intelligence in the workplace. Um, and, and I just find this super anti-capitalism. Um, you know, the, these are technologies that roll out. And, and can you imagine that if in the early days of what one, you know, senators were saying, hey, we're going to ban email. We're going to ban email because it might hurt the post office. You know, hey, we, we, we don't want to, um, you know, we don't want to allow JPEGs to be shown on a screen because it might be offensive to some people. And I just find this like aggressive regulation without education um, to be one of the biggest reasons why the U.S. is just going to fall so far behind and continue to fall so far behind. Because here we have in the United States them just saying like, nope, we're not going to, we want to ban AI in the workplace to protect workers um, versus, uh, you know, literally in the same week, the EU uh, stating that right now they saw last year about $27 billion in AI um, in, throughout the EU. Uh, they think by the end of this decade, by 2030, it will be $800 billion. Um, and, and that's minor compared to McKinsey in the exact same, uh, uh, you know, time frame 2030 said it's going to be five trillion dollars. Um, so there's this massive like need and desire for some of these tools. You know, I as a CIO welcome mm. any ability that I have to kind of help me run my company because you know I have clients, I have consumers, I do have employees, and so many others, and I don't want to get rid of anyone. I want them all to be more efficient. So my my long winded question to you is, you know, what's what is in your mind kind of the the better way to view you know regulation around AI? Um, to protect the humans. So there's a couple of things here. I think it's important to sort of understand how the AI gets its information and how it's been trained um, and whether it contravenes any existing, you know, IP, copyright, et cetera, et cetera. Because I do believe that people's rights should be protected if they have created some work, for example, you know, artists, you know, Carla Ortiz, for example, stood in front of the, the, the US Senate, I think, and gave testimony because she's involved in a, a court case that um, involves um, artists uh, and stability AI. And and I do believe that IP and, and existing copyright should be, you know, protected. I think people should be fairly compensated. Um, and then we're, now we're getting to the, well, it's going to disrupt the workers. So workers, employees should be protected or they should be banned or whatever. And it's like, well, it, it's like saying back in the day, you know, when calculators came out, there was a, you know, there was a lot of, a lot of hoo-ha basically saying that, you know, because calculators have come out, uh, everybody's going to lose their job. Um, now, it's 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 interesting that people draw that parallel, but at the same time, calculators were not automatic. You still had to plug away something. We are getting to a stage where AI understands a task or an instruction. It will go away and, and execute multiple tasks based on that instruction that those tasks could be performed yeah. by another human. Um, and that would actually move, remove their job. So there's 
there's there's varying degrees here in terms of what regulation should and shouldn't do and i think what's happening is is that there's a broad brush approach being applied to regulation right now as a knee-jerk reaction to be seen to do something um, and that's the problem that is probably going to hurt um you know on a, on a region or a, a country by country basis is how how much thought and consideration is actually put into these regulations versus we we need to be seen to do something otherwise we'll get left behind again so that to me it's, is it's a double edged sword with the, with the parallel with web3 and and really you know technology innovation for the past 20 30 years right we really regulation is a new variable um, that has that is addressed mainly because of web3 when you think about web2 or web1 regulation was not really a topic, right? Because quite frankly, technology was just rapidly evolving mm. and it was just evol- it was just rapidly just, you know, identifying new use cases and new applications, right? And all that good stuff. There was never a, a need where regulation had to step in until there, it, we got so big with data models, right? And data harvesting. And we really didn't see regulation start to step into the technology space until probably, you know, the 2010s, I would say, right? When Facebook and Google and all of them started getting so mm. large, right? But then with Web3, regulation had to step in very quickly because of crypto, right? Because people were just getting scammed. People were just getting rug pulled. People were putting in money, you know, and, and there's the concept of, are you dealing with these uh, securities, Right. And that's a, a very that's a new variable that was introduced mm. because of Web three and crypto, but now with AI, we're getting into an interesting conversation which is ethics, right? And it's not necessarily a conversation we were having in Web three or really Web two or Web one, but it's very much going to be at the front of or it should be at the front of mind for uh, for AI or you know what I, I I call AI part of Web three, uh, but you know AI. Mm. access to data how do these models how do they have access you know what is who is the true owners of these data right what what can they what can they read what can they push what can they do how can they manipulate it i mean you're going to start seeing healthcare companies right start leveraging ai models with healthcare data records there's going to be a lot of leakage there pii there mm-hmm. it's just it's 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 a it's a whole new layer that the industry i think is to your point a knee jerk reaction they're trying to get in front of but it's kind of similar a parallel with Web3. It's like they don't really know what they need to solve just yet because uh, the, the space hasn't evolved and it hasn't matured enough to go yeah. and prompt an actual and prompt, no pun intended, but you know, prompt the, the proper discussion, right? Because we don't know. We're just we're just it's speculative discussions right now. You make a you, you I'm gonna tie this back to actually you made a comment earlier about Epic. Um, Epic Healthcare, and it's funny because they actually have and, and health records, and they've done a deal with Microsoft and OpenAI to basically use ChatGPT against the 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 health records and the data that they have. Um, now that that's an a, excellent example mm-hmm. of basically putting blockchain in front of that to basically safeguard that information, and again using you know one, like I said, golden source of truth. Um, it can't be manipulated. It can't be subverted. You know, there's a, a record of every time someone's health information is updated, so it's 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 true and it's verifiable. Um, and then, secondly, is um, and, I, and now I've completely lost my train of thought because, um, <laughs> um, but you know, you can see. Oh, well, well, secondly, is that that is that sort of zero knowledge proof protection of data identity as well? So if you're querying chat GPT against personal health records to find particular trends or things like that, then there should be no identifiable information that is sent back within that reply. Um, and so it's almost a query saying, you know, have these patients experienced X, Y, and Z? Well, the answer would be yes, 10% have, blah, blah, blah. But there would never be anything identifiable that was drawn in and cited, you know, Ooh, as part of that sort of answer like that. or that so study you're, you're or that of research. You're kind of proposing that thing. blockchain could, solve, could serve as a, uh, uh, an, ethic, an ethics or ethical technology control for AI models, right? Yeah. 
Potentially, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, you could pretend. It would depend on the quality of the data and how clean it is and things like that. But potentially, you could have blockchain yeah. as an arbiter Which of truth against a big bias. Problem, even with the morals right now. Um, obviously, what does you know? What does bias mean? Well, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the yeah. one of the things I want to throw out here, and I think this is so, an interesting conversation, is how early. <laughs> we are in this new LLM model, you know, and again, and, and there's a big difference and, and let's just talk yeah. about code. You know, when we, when we think about coding a website or, or code, coding an application, you know, it, that's designed by humans, it's relatively static, meaning it's not going to change. And if it does change, there's, there's a lot of gatekeepers behind why it's going to change and what, what that means behind the scenes to, you know, whether it's a banking application or just a website. Um, when, when in March, when suddenly chat GTP four came out and it was just like, it was mind blowing. It goes, Oh my God, like thing, the, mm-hmm. the game is different. And I'll say today, um, and in fact, uh, today it, it, it absolutely is different again. Um, I noticed, uh, kind of for a while, I'm like, Hey, suddenly my answers that I'm, I'm, I was using GT chat GTP four are, are getting worse. And I didn't really understand that. Um, and so thankfully we, we do have some, uh, good at, good systems out there. And so uh, Stanford University and Berkeley have been doing a study. When ChatGTP came out uh, in March, um, they did a test of 500 questions uh, and ChatGTP 4 got 488 of those questions correct. Um, So 97%, you know, great. That's exactly what I was feeling like. This is really good. Um, It Three weeks ago, they ran the exact same five hundred que- exact same five hundred questions through, and it got two point four percent of them correct. So that is a big variance and a very big issue that we have. That mm. if you make some small changes, someone someone says, "Hey, I don't like this type of answer." It can have the the butterfly effect of like you know, if you go back in time a, a billion years and you step on one butterfly, humans may or may not exist. And I think that's the problem is we're dealing with something so complex that when it does work after decades and decades of work, you you can't really just nuance a few words or a few concepts out of it the same way that you can of normal code. And we've seen the deprecation right off the bat since Microsoft acquired it. Um, Taylor, I'd love to hear your thought on it because you looked a little surprised by that number. Um, I didn't realize that there was such a drop. I I had heard that um, it, the the quality has degraded, um, but I didn't realize it had dropped that much. Um, it's funny. I've been playing around with Claude from Anthropic, and I have been pretty impressed. Um, and I've even queried it to basically give me the sources that it comes back with in terms of information, and it does actually spit back where the sources come from and I go and manually check, well, does this publication exist? Because we've heard in the past that obviously OpenAI just makes it up as it goes along. Um, so, so yeah, so this, this is interesting and this is where we get into, again, we get into the ethical side because there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in creating AI for pe- personal use. And the first thing that I see people talk about is personal coaching, life coaching, therapy, AI boyfriend, AI girlfriend, all companion apps, all this kind of sort of thing. Now, one, there's massive ethical questions around all of those use cases because they're unregulated. Um, They all have professional bodies in the real world when we when humans practice but for some reason ai just seems to be thrown out the window we don't need to think about that the second thing as well is that there's been documented about updating the models and how it has a negative effect on people who have been using those models for a long time that they have formed attachments and relationships with with it because humans are very bad or good um, at anthropomorphizing things um uh, you know, incorporeal objects and cats and dogs and whatnot. So people have been using relationship apps, forming an attachment with the AI, and then basically the the owners of the AI update the models and they no longer perform or answer the questions or speak in the same way back to the person who formed the attachment. And all of a sudden, that that emotional attachment that has been, I, I would you would, as a guess, it's being manipulated to be a- addictive and attractive and now is no longer compliant with what you want it to do. And that has devastating effects on mental health. So there's massive 
questions around one ethical use, which you know we've talked about already, but the impact of updating models for accuracy, um, for accurate for the sake of accuracy, but at the same time, if other people have built services on top of that, have they yeah. been told, or you know, yeah. are they aware the, that this is I actually mean, going to happen? My big takeaway from your point just now is dating apps and the dating landscape is about to get way more complicated. Right? Catfishing is going to take a whole new. Uh, but but what you're talking about is there's a movie a couple of years ago with Joaquin Phoenix, uh, her. What you're talking about is that her. we are we are yeah. quickly. People are, for some reason, and, and we can talk about the social fabric and all the dynamics, that, you know, all the components that uh, uh, at and play mm-hmm. play a role in that. But it seems like people want to get as quick as possible to that her utopia. And it seems like everyone is just pushing, 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 and we're trying to build models to the point where we can eventually rely on AI to do ninety five percent of the things that we want to do in life. It seems like that's 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 where the that's where the, the mm. a lot of the momentum or a lot of the push is, and so you're seeing a lot of it, it's. I would love to see more organizations take LLMs more seriously within the context of the unique natures of their own businesses, instead of trying to go and tackle the mm-hmm. AI can help you know with. Prompt, prompt writing is great. All that stuff is great from a personal perspective, but I would love to see if an AI can actually help me facilitate and actually help me get a loan quicker. I want to see if AI can actually help me, you know, go and uh, make my food order actually a hundred percent accurate, right? Things that little things that frustrate the mm. user on a day-to-day basis in 2023 that we should not be dealing with that could probably be automated very quickly with an AI workflow of some nature that an AI kind of handles it as a proxy. And as maybe going back to your um, uh, implementation days and data days, you know, kind of acting as that nice middleware iPass layer that acts as the right way to route, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look at, uh, so, you know, talking about, uh, you know, enterprise software and, and middleware and stuff like that, um, if you look at how enterprise software is built today, it's, it's Frank, you know, I'll quote a, a, yes. another CEO, it's Frankenstacks. It's basically just stacks of stuff, software and services built on top of each other. But right at the bottom is data. Now, that's all that LLMs and AI need is basically data to run and service and, and do clever things with, which means that we don't need these complex interfaces that have drop down switches, buttons, forms to fill out, et cetera, et cetera, because an AI doesn't need that. It will literally go away and execute tasks and then come back and tell you in it's in whichever way, whether it's test, whether it's uh, voice or whatever. Um, so that side of the enterprise is going to get really interesting because, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we look at workflow and what a business uh, process yeah. means <laughs> from now on, yeah. essentially? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's how I started as well. Time and motion studies, all that kind of sort of thing. You know, what does that now mean with with AI? Um, what does a target operating model look like with AI? Because it certainly shouldn't look the way it should now. You know, with uh, you know bomb level one, two, three. You've got all those processes hanging off underneath it. That's got to be eradicated. Yeah, or or well, that was all designed for us. That now, was designed for the humans means, because we have to. We, well, everyone's yeah, got exactly, their own yeah. database. <laughs> because everyone has their own database, when we go to a website or we do anything, we have to fill out their database so they understand who we are. Versus, as you say, exposing the data that they need yeah. so that they can access it. But it never needs to leave. It never needs to go anywhere. The company, if you're going to ship something to my house. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll let you know next time you need my address. You don't need to have, you don't need, you don't need it. It's mine. I can, you know, I can tell you when you need it. So I, I love those concepts. Um, as we're kind of running out of time real quick, you know, Teo, I'd, I'd love just a, a quick, um, this is what you do. You're looking at, at so many cool things. You've been writing about it for a while. Uh, what's kind of like one cool thing you've seen come out, you know, recently that you've just been blown away by? Um. That's a very good yeah, you question. You've probably not been asked that uh, recently. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I, you know, in the last sort of two years, I mean, we've seen some great things in terms of, you know, the metaverse. We've seen, you know, AR, VR. We've seen uh, Web3. 
true decentralization, you know, true applications in a decentralized way coming out. I've seen the, you know, I've, I've seen distributed computing start to make a comeback in terms of, you know, using blockchain, not as a mining operating system, but as a distributed compute platform as it was supposed to be, I think. And that's quite interesting as well. I think for me, I haven't really seen anything that's lit my fire. And when I do, it'll be, like we said right at the start, that confluence of people taking these disparate technologies and making them work together for a greater good. You know, and whether that's green tech and uh, or whether that's finance or insurance or medical or whatever, I think I'm, I'm waiting for someone to, you know, to understand what conf- true confluence means. Um, under the guise of or under the banner of decentralization, I think, or decentralized tech. So so the confluence of something that actually draws in Web3 in the truest sense. Um, and I think AI and blockchain will be that, will be the, love it. the kind love of it. linchpin for that. Um, Teo, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And this has been a fabulous conversation. Siva, always appreciate you co-hosting with me. Um, I think there's a lot a lot more questions that we kind of opened up for people than, than probably answers. And that's just because how early we are. And, and you know, we, if we recorded this podcast next week, it would be an entirely different set of, you know, comments and questions because it's, it, everything is evolving so quickly. Um, and to hear of, you know, a, a yeah. massive LLM, uh, like chat GTP four getting deprecated, you know, by 90%, you know, just within a, a, a single quarter, um, you know, that that's devastating. Can you imagine if like your computer, everyone's computer just stopped working or, or to, you know, you filled in some Excel fields and it just came back wrong. Like that's not, that's not a mature product. That's, that means mm-hmm. that we're still very much in the alpha beta phase. Um, and there's a lot of work to be done. So, so why whales, if you're wondering, you know, where we are, uh, it's still very early, according according here to, to Teo and, and Siva and myself. Uh, but that just means that we got a lot of work to go. And for all of us that are building here in the, the Web3, um, there's a lot of meat left on this bone and there's a lot of work to be done. So, Fly Wheels, we'll see you guys next time.